This is Beacon Evangelical Church Online, seeking to be fruitful and multiply. A light to our online neighborhood, a beacon set on the hill. We aim to be a beacon of God's good news online and wherever he tells us to go. We are here to show and tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. Build up the body of the church in love until all are ready and able to take on this task. Beacon Evangelical Church Online. Welcome, welcome, welcome to you all, church family. Um, bless you. Thank you for joining us here this morning, Beacon Church Online. We've got our brother Gurab speaking today, and he's going to be speaking on destructive pride. And I'm really, we're all looking, really looking forward to his word as he brings that to us. But we want to welcome, we want to get ourselves ready in a sense, for that word to come to us. We want to take some time. We want to, I also want to encourage you, if you're here now or later on, to, to get involved on the chat, um, make comments if there's something that's touching you, you want to speak a word of worship through the chat, or, and I'm sure we're going to be, Gaurav's going to ask you to get involved in that way later on as well. So be ready for that but also to make comment afterwards if you're watching it later. Please do give us a thumbs up or make any comments or get in contact with us through email or Facebook channel. We really would like to hear from you. But again, as I said, we're getting ourselves ready to receive that word. So we're going we're gonna to open with a, a word of prayer. Father God, we bless you. We honor and glorify you. Lord God, we want to be in a spirit of worship. We want to be in an attitude that we're ready to receive from you, to, to see you as you are. So open our eyes, oh God. Open our ears. Soften our hearts, oh God, that we're ready to receive all that you have for us. Help us to get ready. Help us to shake off. Shake off anything that's, that's bothering us. Maybe shake off our tiredness this morning. To shake off maybe um, negative thoughts or, or a focus where we're not looking at you. We're looking at the people. We're looking at things. We're looking at, we're drawn into a battle about attitudes or what we think is right. And not ready to hear from you what you are speaking to us about. Help us to shake all of that off and be ready to receive you and your word, you and your worship. We can lift our eyes and our hearts and our voices and what we type on our keyboards. We will lift them all to you, the great and mighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords, the one that rose, raised Jesus from the dead. You, O oh God, will be our focus. You, the King forever, will be looking upon. Blessed be your name. So work in us in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Now, now that we've done that, I hope that you're ready to start to get involved in our worship songs. I'm going to have a couple of songs there running together, and I hope that you will get involved at home, that you will sing along, maybe dance along, you'll wave some flags if you've got them, you'll get up and stamp your feet, but you will get involved in worshipping, lifting up your hearts, spirits, and self to the King of Kings. Amen? Let us worship.
Christ be magnified. Now I'm going to just throw a little spanner in all of works. I want to 
have that song go again. It's the first time probably that I've heard it, and I'd like to really have the opportunity to worship the Lord again with that song. So we're going to have that song again, and I hope that you can involve yourself. Involve yourself in the worship of our God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that we will indeed make sure that Christ is magnified, that he is magnified. He is magnified in the altar of our lives. He is the center. He's where we go to. Hallelujah. Let his, oh, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's have that song again, then, please. Thank you. Bless the Lord.
Hallelujah. I want you, wherever you are, Lord, to, wherever you are, people out there, just give praise unto him. Glorify his great name. Lift up his name. Exalt him right with you. That Lord, he, he, the Lord will be the center of your life, the focus of your life. Oh, that you will die to self, Lord. Die to self. That they, we will die to self and live unto you, O oh God. Blessed be your name. Oh, let your children, oh, let your children be ex lifting their hearts to you. Set their face to serve you when it's hard, not when, it, when it's difficult, when it doesn't bring great accolades, when it doesn't bring that you're the center of, of good attention, that even when, it, when you're the center of negative attention, we still can rejoice and praise and celebrate your great name. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah to your name, oh God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this reminder. As we continue our next song, Living Hope, we just pray, continue. Let's let us continue to worship our God. Let us continue to put him right in the center of our hearts. Hallelujah. Game. 
the morning that filled the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion picked the way has no claim on me Jesus Lord is the Jesus Christ, the living hope, the living hope for today, the living hope for right now. I want to bless the Lord. Glory to his great name. Hallelujah to you, O Lord. We give you thanks and praise. We glorify your name that you are the living hope, the hope for today, the hope for all nations, the hope for all kingdoms. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I want to invite my brother, Gaurav, to come up to, to give us this word on destructive pride. Bless the Lord. I don't know about you this morning, but I really needed some Holy Ghost fire. And it's not because I'm feeling really, really cold, but it's because I'm missing that opportunity that we have to praise and worship together. And when God moves in a great and mighty, powerful way, I, you know, I've been missing that. And today, I don't know for you, but the worship for me today really just drew God, drew me into, I should say, God. Um, and just before I begin, I just want to recognize um, our problem solvers who we have in the background who are working really, really hard um, to make sure we can uh, speak to you guys today. So I just want to give God thanks for them today. Um, before I begin my word, we're going to play um, a version, a Christian version, I, I hope we'll get it on in a minute, of um, Blankety Blank. Now, those of you who are old enough to remember Blankety Blank, um, Rupinder, I know, is old enough. Um, um, yeah, and I've mentioned you for a reason. <laughs> will know that you will be given sort of like a set of phrases and you need to fill in the blanks, okay? So um, it's not quite with the same kind of excitement as you would have had back in the day when Blankety Blank was on, but you'll have in a minute four phrases um, and these are four phrases taken from the Bible um, and you have to fill in the blanks. Just whilst I'm waiting for the um, PowerPoint to come up, I'm just gonna read those, um, oh, it's on, praise the Lord. Um, Give me a second. Would you mind just clicking, clicking the next thing? Right. Slide. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I need two more minutes. Okay. Right. In that case, um, I'm going to say them out aloud. Um, hopefully, I can read it clearly enough, um, and I'll just ask someone just to type it up on the chat. The first one is for God so loved the world. Blank. The second one is. Honor your blank. The third one is, I'm the way that blank. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> nearly gave it away. I'm the way the blank. And the fourth one is, 
Pride goes before blank. I'll read them out again. So number one is, for God so loved the world, blank. The second one is, honor your blank. The third one is, I'm the way, the blank. And the final one is, pride goes before blank. And I'm going to ask you guys, please, to write down your responses to those blanks on the chat function. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes um, just to do that. Fingers crossed, it'll all go all okay. And I will repeat them every so often, just to remind you. Okay, so just to remind you, the first one was, for God so loved the world, blank. Number two was, honor your blank. The third one was, I'm the way, the blank. And the fourth one is pride goes before blank. Okay, I'm just going to give you about another 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, that. Oh, no, you've got to fill in a bit more than that. You've got to fill it into the end of the sentence, Serena. Um, it isn't God goes before that. Yes, you're right, but need to finish it off. <laughs> Um, pride goes before destruction, correct? Well done, well done, Serena. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Any more answers there, Tim? Oh, that's okay. Okay, no worries. In the Serena says, um, I am the way, the truth. All right, I am the way, the truth. Okay, for number three. Okay, I'm going to go through the answers now anyway. Um, for God so loved the world. Sorry, your click is not working. Click is not working. Could you just um, reveal that answer for me? <laughs> Oh, okay. Right. I want to try and be able to read it, but it's really small in my notes. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Something along that, if you've got that, well done. Number two, and my children, if you're listening, this is a very important one for you. Honour your father. Go on. Okay, honour your mother and father. Actually, my, my version says father and mother. So I just want to make that very, very clear, children at home. Um, the third one, which I almost gave away, is I am the way, the truth, and... The life. Thank you. Yeah, you got that one down. Well done to Kayla. And the fourth one is pride goes before destruction. Okay. Um, um, and I'm sure we all had different answers, but they're roughly the same thing. Um, and what I want us to look at today is Proverbs 16, verse 18, which tells us the true effect of pride. Okay, It tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Before a fall. Um, often in the, the English idiom tells us that pride goes before a fall. But actually the Bible tells us, this ancient Jewish proverb tells us that pride actually leads to destruction, which is today the title of my message. Um, destructive pride. So before I continue any further, I just want to pray. I just want to refocus um, back on to the message. Father, as we come before you, we know that there's a lot going on, Lord, in the background, but we just pray, Father, that indeed your name will be praised, that your name will be honoured, and Father God, that whatever it is you have to say, I pray that you would reveal it through me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
So before I go any further, I think it's really, really important that we kind of define what the term pride means. Now, if I was to do a Google search of pride, okay, one of the things that we might find is an image that perhaps I'm not sure you're going to get this image. Or I'll try the cl clicker one more time. Hallelujah. Okay, it's working. Praise the Lord. Okay, you might get something that looks like this. Okay, that's one of the first images you will find. And when we think of the word pride in the termly sense, that may well be something that comes to mind. Um, the second one is this idea of someone who thinks very, very highly of themselves, um, puts themselves in a very, very important position or an important place. Um, but another one could be is when you have pride in something that your children have done. Okay? It could be a sporting uh, match, it could be an examination result, it could be the fact that they've actually cleaned their bedrooms, hallelujah, and you, know, you feel a sense of pride for them. Yes, miracles can happen. Um, but when we look at the word, it tells us okay, that God opposes the proud but gives face to the humble. When we're thinking about pride in a Christian sense, we're thinking about anything or anyone who elevates itself above God, anyone who sees themselves as being more important than God, anyone who thinks that they can do more than God can do, then that is an example of pride. And if we want to think of one particular individual who is the orchestrator, who in fact shows a huge deal of pride, we think of Satan himself. Satan who's elevated himself above God. Satan who thinks that he is better than God. And this pride, this sin, is one that is destructive. It's one that can cause us a lot of problems. So in order to understand why I've looked at the message of pride today, I want us to look at a character who penned those words in Proverbs 16 verse 18, King Solomon. Now those of you who know King Solomon know that he was the son of King David, okay, the one who defeated David and Goliath. And so Solomon had huge shoes to fill. Indeed, according to the world, we might say that Solomon did definitely fill those shoes. Solomon achieved a great deal in his life. He possessed great wealth. And with that wealth, he possessed huge power. But in spite of all the wealth and all the power that Solomon had, if there is one thing that he is known for, okay, it is his wisdom. Even educational establishments, including King Solomon Academy here in Birmingham, um, are named after him because his name is synonymous with pride. In 1 Kings 3 verse 15, God asks Solomon, what shall I give to you? Now I know if I was Solomon, I know exactly what I would ask for. If God said to me, what can I give you? I would have asked for a healthy, no, I'll take that back. I would have asked for an obscene obscenely obese bank account um, I would have asked for um, um, you know um, to live a healthy life and I would have asked God for the biggest miracle of all and that is straight teeth um, however Solomon responds to all of these things by asking for um, God an understanding heart to judge your people that I might be able to discern between what is good and what is evil Solomon asked for wisdom and as a result of what Solomon asked for, God gave him both riches and honours too. Now, it would be hard to say at this particular moment, in this, these particular verses, that Solomon was a man of pride. He was humble before God. He was asking God for wisdom to lead people. But I want to make it clear that Solomon's story doesn't actually end there. Yes, Solomon made many, many wise decisions. He possessed riches beyond our imagination. And he successfully built the temple in Jerusalem. But after a while, he began to flaunt, flaunt his wisdom. He started to flaunt his treasures. And ultimately, he started to show his own pride. You know, when we read of his meeting with the Queen of Sheba, I think, in 1 Kings chapter 10, we're hard-pressed to find Solomon giving thanks to God for what God has given him. He takes the praise for himself. And in addition to all of that I've mentioned, King Solomon, who was a lover of women, took on many wives, followed false gods, and brought heathenism into Israel, something which God had ex expressly forbidden. Solomon had let pride in. And now I know what you must be thinking. Solomon did all these things, but he decided a died a successful man. So if pride is such a big thing, why did Solomon not see destruction? 
well, I want to say in um, 1 Kings 3 verse 13, God promised to give Solomon riches and honor. And God is not quick to rescind on his promises. Um, but I also want to make very, very clear that towards the end of his life, things weren't plain sailing for Solomon. Um, some adversaries had been raised up against Solomon. And so for him in the end, um, things were not easy. The result of his pride meant that Israel had a pretty tumultuous history after him. And I would probably go on to say that Israel continues to have a very tumultuous present. Such are the effects of pride. So what does a prideful Solomon have to do with us at Beacon? Well, firstly, we're about to go through a big change with a new building. And just like the temple that was built in, uh, built in Jerusalem, we must ensure that it is God and not us who are given the glory. Secondly, however, there is a culture in church where we're very, very quick to honour individuals, lavish praise on any achievement and massage egos. And this culture has seeped into this church too. And I believe that God is calling us to address it. You know, it's no surprise that our leadership concluded that at the beginning of 2021, we need to lament. However, more than anything, pride leads to an individual's destruction. You see, Satan is so full of pride that his final destiny is one of eternal destruction. And if we do not address this issue within ourselves, then the reality is that we will have the same wages that the enemy will have, a deadly eternal destruction. So how then do we avoid this temptation that is pride? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to confess. Proverbs 28 verse 13 tells us that he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses them and forsakes them will have mercy. You see, if we take this verse literally, which is how we ought to treat the Bible, we need to do the following. We need to uncover our sin. We need to openly confess it. And finally, we need to forsake our sin. Now, in order to do those things, in order to confess, in order to confront our sin, it will be something that is incredibly uncomfortable and difficult. You see, we live in a world where rather than deal with the wrong that we have done, we're encouraged to cover up our own wrongdoings. I remember not so long ago, there was a phone hacking scandal of involving the now defunct news of the world. And for those of you who don't know about this particular scandal, it involved a number of people hacking into the telephone lines of prominent celebrities and prominent politicians and members of the British royal family in order to get the latest gossip. Now, these individuals who were involved in this were undoubtedly encouraged, coerced, and perhaps even bullied into doing this. And now, of fear or perhaps in response to, to the pro to promises they were given, they found themselves engaging in something that was a clear violation of one's privacy. What was the overall result? Did the news of the world get the latest gossip that they wanted? Actually, no. It was one of shame. The newspaper closed. Prominent figures within the company had to resign. And you see, the extent of pride in this company meant that they thought that they were above the law of the land, but also above the commandments of, in, of, of insincerity. And God invoked his word where he said the wicked will not go unpunished. Unfortunately, however, the reality is we live in a society where we're encouraged to hide things, when we're not encouraged to confess you see, it's okay to hide things if it's in the public interest, or it's okay to hide something if it's in our interest. However, we've got to remember that our Lord is a God of justice, and he will always and eventually provide that justice. You see, pride, it never wins. What I found even more interesting was when I was preparing for this, we are supposed to live in a society where we're encouraged to be open. Um, in terms of mental health, for instance, the NHS encourages us to connect with others as the opportunity to be sociable is an outlet where we can forget our negative thoughts. And the NHS describe that we need an opportunity to reframe our negative thoughts. However, what I want us to think about is where do those negative thoughts stem from? Do those negative thoughts actually stem from things that others have said to you? Or is it actually something that is within our own lives that we need to reflect on and we need to think about? You see, those negative thoughts sometimes require deep contemplation and reflection. And that can be very, very uneasy. 
And it can be very uneasy when you have to look at parts of pride in your own life that leads to these negative thoughts and these negative ways of thinking. That doesn't mean I'm saying that if we have mental health issues, we shouldn't get any help. But we must make sure that we have an opportunity to reflect on those thoughts, reflect on those things that God is speaking to us about. What I'm saying is that the Bible offers us challenging but very helpful strategies in which we can overcome some of those issues, those negative thoughts that we have. And if time permits, I want to discuss it later in the message. I also want us to think about this phrase. If it works, why fix it? If you're doing something wrong, if you're doing something that, that might benefit the public or benefit ourselves, why should we fix it? And, you know, we might tend to adopt these phrases, these ways of thinking in our own lives. In education, for instance, um, I will not name certain schools, but you're expected to fully endorse and adopt some of the very, very bad practices of those people who are in charge. And if you don't do this, they will happily destroy your career. And as a result of this, we have schools of compliance where discussion is not allowed and leaders get what, basically what they want. But if these leaders were to face the wrong that they have done, if they were able to come to terms with some of the uncomfortable aspects of their leadership and forsake those things, it would be something that is very uncomfortable, but it would be the right thing to do. See, as I mentioned earlier, the examples I gave you of pride is that pride leads to destruction. And even if something is of benefit to you, and it seems to be working for you. If we don't deal with that pride, if we don't deal with that wrongdoing, it will lead to destruction. I want us to look at the example of Saul, who eventually became Paul. Saul vehemently and religiously persecuted believers in Jesus. You know, he was proud of the fact that he was... Um, persecuting these these group of people who were talking about Jesus being the Messiah so what happened the Lord blinded him and in that time God forcefully uncovered his sin and asked Saul why are you persecuting me you see Saul's sin was uncovered but as his sin was uncovered he openly confessed and Saul forsook his sin and later on, he became Paul. He was a changed man. No longer was he this man full of pride, but he was someone who had one resolute thing that he needed to do, and that was to draw others to God. So this Paul, who was forced to confess his wrongdoing through the power of the Holy Spirit, was given this divine authority, um, this divine power to preach, to do miracles, and was sent by God on these missionary journeys. Now, was it easy for him? No. But whilst he was reliant on others to perhaps provide for him, whilst he lived a homeless life as a Christian, and whilst he was dictated to by the Lord, all things that we would see in the world as being something that is unsuccessful, Paul was able to pen the words from prison in Philippians 4 verse 13, where he came to the realisation that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now I'm not going to pretend that the Christian walk is an easy one, you know, humanity is naturally inclined to be prideful. However, when we learn the extent that we rely on God, we soon learn to be humble. Which brings me on to my second point. In order to combat pride, we must learn to be humble. Would you mind just clicking the next thing, please? You know, in order to tackle this issue, we need to tackle our thinking. You know, in fact, when I put this together, I had to wrestle with a number of things about myself, all the things that were stopping me from being humble. And that's one of praise. And I don't mean praise to God. I mean praise to individuals. You know, when we think of the word praise, we might think of uplifting others, bigging up others, complimenting them. And, you know, a study by the National Broadcasting Corporation in America found that praising others through compliments makes us feel good, both giving and receiving them. You know, who's going to disagree with that? I love hearing my wife saying, you know, you look good today. Your hair is on point. She didn't say that this morning, by the way. Um, or, you know, your teeth are looking straight, which, by the way, she has never, ever said. Um, and she needs to fix up a little bit there. But anyway, um, back to the topic in hand. The NBC advise that when it comes to giving um, out compliments, 
let it rain. And this sounds like excellent advice. It sounds like an excellent thing to do, to praise individuals when they do something that is really, really good. But I actually want us to look at this through the lens of the Bible. Ezekiel 28 verse 17 says the following about Satan. It says his heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And as we read on, God says, I cast you to the ground. You know, when an individual is praised, just like we found perhaps with Satan praising himself in his own eyes, a flesh lifts itself up and we become corrupted because in our imaginations, we think of ourselves as being great, think of ourselves as being so wonderful and so wise in our own eyes. You know, this ultimate result of pride is destruction where we will be cast to the ground. You know, if God was cast Satan to the ground, what is it? What, uh, what will stop him from doing the same to us if we allow pride um, in? You know, our society might endorse praise of other individuals, but if this is done in an unwise way, it will have some very serious eternal consequences. And as I mentioned earlier, this culture has not merely seeped into the church, but it's become part and parcel of what many churches do. Rather than praising God, we're quick to praise others for their achievements, their singing, and even the word that they bring. And what have we seen as a result of this? People who have thought so much of themselves that they have elevated themselves above God. Now, I know I'm being frank, and I know I'm being perhaps a little bit upsetting in what I'm saying. But I want us to think about the people in this church who've been praised to the rafters, who ended up leaving Beacon because they thought they were too good for this church. Not because God told them to, not because God instructed them to move on. Or more, more worryingly, they thought they were too good for God. They thought they were too good for church and fell away. You know, we've got to be careful in our praise so that we don't inadvertently release this spirit of pride. So we don't allow pride into, the li into our own lives or the lives of others. Now, does this mean I think praising others is wrong? No. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 in the NIV tells us to encourage one another, to build each other up. That means that we do need to engage in conversations with individuals, commenting on all that they do well. But encouragement also means that we gently guide others to greater levels of trusting in God and in greater levels of humility towards God. This means that there might be times where we need to rebuke. And I know that we often see rebuking as a bad and a demeaning thing. But Proverbs 27, verse 5, I believe, tells us that our open rebuke is better than love carefully considered. Yes, rebuke might be demeaning, but when it is done in love, it leads to humility. Humility leads to God, and it can transform one's life. Now, I recognise that there are many of us who may be wondering, um, who may well be thinking, why should I allow myself to be rebuked by others? Why should I allow others to rebuke my own children? That rebuke, as I said, if it transforms someone's life, if it transforms a life of your own child, don't stop that rebuke from happening. And I know that there are a number of us who may well be thinking, why am I only speaking of humility through a corporate church lens? Well, I want us to focus on how we individually too can chase humility. As I mentioned, the first place is confession, but another place is through praise. And this time I mean not praising individuals, but I mean praising God. Ephesians 1 verse 11 to 12 tells us that we've in, obtained an inheritance from God. And so that all we do should be to the praise of his glory. This morning, we've been singing songs of praise, praising God, which draws us into his um, presence. But I want us to think about how does that praise enable us to develop a humble relationship with God? Firstly, praise is an acknowledgement of who God is. When we praise him, we see God for all that he is. We see that he is the great I am. We see that he is the Alpha and the Omega. We see that actually we need to go to him and not to others for whatever issue we may have in our lives and you know there are times even when I'm in church 
you know, where I want to get down on my knees and I want to praise God. Um, and you know what? I'm too busy worrying and thinking about what other people are going to say and whether my praise is sincere or insincere or not. You know, that is pride. I should not care what people think of me when I praise. I should be able to get down on my knees and praise him. And I just want you to think about the last week, what has been going on in this area of Hansworth. All the things, all the things that we are hearing about, people losing their lives before they should have done. I believe that the Lord is saying that, you know, that we, we can open up the youth clubs. We can put more police in our areas. We can educate our young people. But unless we get down on our knees and humbly confess before God, you know, this is because of our pride. This is because of, Lord, all these things that we thought we could do without you. Things are not going to change. If we want to see a move of God in this area and with our young people, we need to get down. We need to get down on our knees and humbly come before the Lord, put our pride aside, not think that we can fix it, but allow God to fix that situation. I digress. I apologize. But secondly, when there is a breakthrough, there is a breakthrough, sorry, when we praise. You know, it was because the Israelites praised that the walls of Jericho tumbled down. It's because Paul and Silas prayed that the prison walls came down. And you know, if we choose not to praise, the very stones will cry out. And I don't know about you, but I refuse to let the stones get the breakthrough that God has promised me in my life. You know, there is nothing more exciting, awesome and humbling when your praise releases God's power and a breakthrough um, occurs in your life. Provided, of course, you acknowledge God's complete victory and assuring that breakthrough for you. So if you want to right now, feel free to pause this. Feel free to pause what you're listening to and give him the praise for the things that he has done. And I promise you, there will be a turnaround in the way that you think and the things that are going on in your lives. Hallelujah. And you know, confession leads to humility. But humility also leads to action. And the action that I want to speak about now is an unconventional one. And it's one that we've heard a lot about of recently, and that is lamenting. Now, I know we've heard a lot about lamenting recently, and I'm unashamedly plagiarizing. Well, I'm not actually plagiarizing because I'm acknowledging where it's coming from, but I'm unashamedly copying some of the things that Pastor Tim said in his message at the start of the year. This isn't because I'm unable to come up with ideas of my own, but I believe that the Lord has prompted me to do this. And so I must remain obedient to him. You know, when people think of lamenting, um, we often see it as a sign of in, um, inaction. You know, many, I believe, see lamenting as a sign of emotional, um, emotional madness, which leads to absolutely nothing, um, or both within the world and a church setting. You see, we live in a world when we see a problem, we are trained to diagnose it. This isn't necessarily the case with lamenting. Lamenting isn't necessarily about diagnosing the problem and sorting it out. Lamenting, you see, involves hours of prayer, crying, complaining, blubbering, groaning, making sounds that you didn't think could come out of you. You know, it's a big act of humility. However, it's in those moments of praying, it's in those moments of crying, it's in those moments of complaining and blubbering that you activate the power of God because you recognize that you cannot solve a situation in your own strength, but God, he can. You know, a church that believes that it can solve poverty in its own power, evangelize in its own strength, or even worship because of its quality musicians has elevated itself above God and has allowed pride in to infiltrate what it does. So what do we need to do if we recognize that we have done this? If we recognize we've elevated ourselves above God? That's right, we need to lament. And lament, um, to Pastor Tim spoke of four things associated with lamenting. The first one is complaining. You know, we are human. We have a natural inclination to complain, or at least I do. But complaining allows you to be honest before God. But it allows God the opportunity to be honest before us too. Um, not that he would ever be dishonest. The second thing that Pastor Tim spoke of was um, confession. Because confession rescues us from a victim mentality. I think that it's very important um, that we think about 
how victim mentality or having a victim mentality is associated with pride. And how is this, you might ask? You know, when we see ourselves as victims, there is a tendency for us to conclude that we are more important in our own sight, um, that um, people are out to get us. We see ourselves as being a victim and we see our issues being more important um, than everybody else's issues. By adopting this mentality, we may allow pride to get in because our opinions become obnoxious and we fail to see our own pride. I'm telling you that I know what I'm talking about because I've done this myself in a church setting where I've seen myself as a victim and I've allowed pride to get in. And my obnoxious opinions um, have meant that I've been unable to listen to others. You see, confessing this victim mentality sets us free from that um, oppression that tries to hold on to us. I think that this point is so important that we need to look at the Bible. You know, when being crucified, Jesus said of his adversaries, the people who put him on the cross in Luke 23 verse 24, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Now, according to society, Jesus did nothing wrong. And therefore, he was an innocent victim. However, Jesus didn't choose to see himself as a victim. He didn't choose to see himself in this way. And because, of, because he recognized the internal purpose behind his crucifixion, behind his death and behind his resurrection, we need to recognize that even in our suffering, our God is not against us, but he is for us. And that when we do suffer, God's eternal purpose is in our life and in the lives of others will take place. The third thing Tim spoke about was declaring the truth. You know, when we recognize our, who our God is through lamenting, we can declare the truth. And when we start declaring the truth, our faith will rise. And as our faith will rise, we see God do things. You know, there are some things that you will believe for and you will see God surpass that. The fourth thing, you'd, fourth thing Tim spoke about was committing to the truth. Then just as Jesus, we commit, um, commit to the truth. You see, lamenting helps us to recognize and come to terms with the truth about ourselves and God. When we are committed to serve the Lord, it's difficult for pride to take us off course. And rather than destruction, we have this kind of spiritual regeneration, which only God through the Holy Spirit can give us. What we've got to remember, however, that lamenting is a major requirement for godly change. It may seem stupid, it may go against the opinion of ourselves, but it beats the pride that exists in all of us and helps us to go from glory to glory, just as God intended. And by this, I don't mean earthly glory, but um, which is only a passing moment, but that internal glory, which is everlasting. So as I come to the end of the message, I want us to think about the following question. Why is Satan described as fallen? It's because he elevated himself above God. He's full of pride. And this pride will lead to his eternal destru destruction. Now this is a personal opinion, so I would ask you to study this for yourself. But I don't believe Satan has received the full wages for his pride yet. Certainly if I read the book of Revelation, I think there's more yet to come for him and his kingdom which means that Satan is still able to roam the earth and he's still able to coerce, confuse and live out his modus operandi to steal and to kill and to destroy. I believe that this is what has been happening in this area and I believe this is what's happening across the nation and across the world. I believe that Satan knows his end and so he's seeking to conquer humanity and to convince them to lift themselves above God and this is his strategy. And although this might be uncomfortable for us to hear, he wants to take all those who do not know Jesus to the pit of hell with him. If you do not know Jesus and you're listening to this message right now, it is no coincidence that you're listening to it. You see, God wants to save you from the eternal destruction. And so I would encourage you to let your pride, your intellect, your unbelief in God be cast aside and listen carefully. Satan convinced Adam and Eve to sin against God. What happened to them? They were cut off from God because they allowed their pride to supersede the wisdom, the laws of God. If we do not know God, 
then there is a huge wall that prevents us from knowing him. This wall is sin, which we can also call pride. However, if you know that you need to know God today, you can break that wall down. You can confess your pride and wrongdoing before God. So just as I finish, I want you to join in, with me, join in praying with me. The first one, or for those of you who do not know God, if you don't know God and you want to know him today, I just invite you to repeat these words after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer and asking for the forgiveness of my sins. I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross at Calvary that I might be forgiven and have eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. Father, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and I ask you right now to come to my life and be my personal Lord and Saviour. I repent of my sins and will worship you all the days of my life. Because your word is truth, I confess with my mouth that I am born again and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I just pray for all those people who have prayed that prayer right now. Lord, I pray that the enemy, Lord God, will not be able to infiltrate Lord God and 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 cause um, arrows and confusion in their lives Lord I pray that this will be a changing and a transformation Lord God in their lives that it will affect not only them but the lives of those around around them and Lord God I pray for those of us who do know you who know Father God that perhaps we have let pride in perhaps we have let something Lord God in that we that we need to get rid of Oh, Father, we confess these before you now and we ask you, Lord God, to forgive us so that, Father God, we can be used for the purposes of your kingdom. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God in the highest terms. Thank you, Brother Gura, for that word. Uh, and it's just, um, I'm always mindful. Um, the key thing about when we're challenged by, by God, when God is speaking to us, we need to make a response, just as Gura was asked. You need to do something about it. And I just want to ask that as our, we're going to go into our final, to our final song, that you'll take some time during the song to make that response to God. You will continue to maybe, if you need to, surrender your destru destructive pride to him. Because the ultimate doing wrong is not the thing that makes that makes everything go wrong. It's when we don't do anything to make it right. When we don't accept, as Gurav said, we don't want to confess, we don't want to lament, we don't want to make a change. We've got to want to make a change, and that will make a difference. So let's take this time as we, as we listen to this worship song. I hope get involved with this worship song that we will get respond to God appropriately. Amen? So we're going to have the songs, Stones. Bless God.
Bless the Lord. Glory to God. Focus our attention on you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God of all glory, reach into our hearts and speak to us about where we are with you right now and where we need to be. Come Holy Spirit and lead us in all truth. Come Holy Spirit and show us where we stepped out, where we, we're not in the, the center of your will. Show us what we need to take off and what we need to put on and we need to put on Jesus. Lord God Almighty, work in us, O oh God. Take hold of us. Holding on to you for life The desert will never take my song Oh, the desert will never take my song I will praise you And I will praise you I won't let the storms cry I won't let the storms me with the promise, dancing where you prophesy, still shouting of everything you've done. High up on the mountain, I was made to testify, forever you will have my song, oh forever you will have my song. And I will praise you, I will praise you, I won't let the stones cry, I won't let the stones cry out, and I will praise you, something in me has to, I won't let the stones cry, I won't let the stones cry out. The stronger I praise, the stronger the pain, the stronger my faith grows, the higher the need, the higher I reach, the greater the cost, the more I believe for, the longer the wait, the longer I praise, the stronger the stronger my faith grows, the higher the need, the higher I reach, the greater the cost, the more I believe for, and I will praise you, and I will praise you, I won't let the stones cry, I won't let the stones cry out. And I will praise you, something in me has to, I won't let the storms cry, I won't let the storms cry out, and I will praise you, and I will praise you, I won't let the storms cry. 
will praise you. I will praise you. I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. I will praise you. Something in me has to. I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. And I will praise you, God. And I will praise you. I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. And I will praise you. Something in me has to. I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. And I will praise you. And I will praise you. I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. And I will praise you. Something in me has to. I won't let the stones. Hallelujah. We praise the great name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I will praise you. Something in me has to. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, glory to God. We won't be, won't be outdone by stones, oh God. We thank you. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all the time that we've been able to spend with you. Lord God, here together as a family, as a, as a people of God, we bless you, we praise you, we exalt you, Lord God. We want to turn our face towards you, Lord God, and we want to make sure that this is going to be just a, the start of something in us, Lord God, that we do business with you, oh God, that you will transform us, oh God, turn us away from destructive pride, oh God, Turn our hearts, oh God, to, to lament before you. Turn our hearts to pour out, not just put on a brave face, not just say, you know, I'm getting by, not be just, you know, a good stiff upper lip. None of that, Lord God. We will surrender before you will be honest, before you where we at, if we're angry or we're upset with you, we'll be disappointed. Anything that we are with you, Lord God, with the situations that we're in, Lord, all that we'll just pour it out in truth before you that so that we can be delivered, so that you can speak to us honestly and truthfully, Lord, into our hearts and into our situations, so that we can be transformed, so that we can be lifted up again in you, so that we can know you again, and that our relationship with you will be restored Lord, restored to overflow, restored, that we can speak of it, again, of it again, restored, that we will be sharing it with others, oh God, oh God, work in the midst of us, oh God, bring us back from destructive pride, bring us back from that road that leads to destruction, Lord God, bring us back honestly and truthfully to you, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you. I'm going to just hand over to my sister Elaine to, for our notices, but we've been really glad that you've been here today. And I hope you are glad. And, uh, you know, let us know. Let us know what the impact has been for you of this service, what the Lord has been saying to you, maybe in the comments, maybe in the chat, maybe through our Facebook, through email, so our, all our contact details are in the description. Please reach out to us in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Sister Elaine.
So welcome everybody. Thanks for bearing with us with our few hiccups today. Um, it's really good that you have been with us. Um, so very quickly, Friday coming, uh, 5th of February, wow, 5th of February, is our monthly day of prayer and fasting. It will be on Zoom only, and I would encourage as many of you as possible to fast that day and to join the meeting in the evening from 7.30 until 9 o'clock. Tim will send the link in the normal way, and he will be leading uh, what he's called a day to draw near to God. So the focus will be to set, time, uh, to set aside time for personal prayer and coming together to worship and lift up our community and country to God for them to draw near to him also. We really need to do that. And uh, just to remind you again that uh, since we're here um, setting up, the foyer will be open from 10 o'clock until 10.30 so that um, those of you who live locally can quickly drop off food bank items in the foyer. That's on a Sunday. And it continues to uh, be open on Monday mornings from 9.30 to 11.30. Uh, please make use of that time. And then next Sunday, 7th of February, our service will be live streamed on YouTube at 11 a.m. I will be speaking on the need to pray. It will also be a family service, so there will be involvement and resources for the children. Join us then. Thank you.